Hello and welcome to the episode 139 of What A Fab Day. I am your host, Simon Mas. Today, we have the filming of some promo clips, a press lunch party for Surgeon Peppers and John and Yoko becoming an item. On the 19th of May 1961, the Beatles, with Pete Best on drums, performed at the Top Ten Club in Hamburg, West Germany. In 1962, we have another performance of the Beatles with the same lineup, performing at the Star Club for their third Hamburg residency. 1963, the Beatles took part to the second evening of the Roy Orbison Package Tour, performing at the Gaumon Cinema in Hanley, near Stroke-on-Trent. And we have returned to an alternative approach to the promotion of the band, on the 19th of May 1966. Still unwilling to appear on TV to push the sales of a single, their paperback writer was due to be released in UK and in the States in the next few days, the Beatles were at the EMI Studios in London to record a number of different clips to be distributed to TV stations around the world. The day was spent filming mimed performances of paperback writer and Rain. As it had happened on the 23rd of November 1965, for the video promos for We Can Work It Out and other songs, the crew and equipment came from Intertel VTR services, while the director was Michael Lindsay Hogg, director of Ready Steady Go. Between 10.40 am and 2 pm, the Beatles completed a color film for Rain and another for Paperback Writer. These films, along with a short introduction film today, were aired by CBS's The Ed Sullivan Show on the 5th of June, between 8 and 9 pm Eastern Standard Time. In the afternoon, from 3.30 to 6.15 pm, the band and the crew filmed another two clips, this time in black and white, for the various British local televisions and for the BBC. TV in Britain was monochrome until March 1967. The first time they were aired was on ABC television on the 25th of June, between 5.50 and 6.35 pm, for its Goodbye Lucky Stars, the final edition of Thank Your Lucky Stars. To conclude this busy day, between 7 and 11 pm, For No One was completed with the recording of Alan Seville's French horn solo. For his performance, Seville received credits on the album's leaves, leading to a lot more work, and £52.50, about £985 in 2020 money. In Mark Lewison's The Complete Beatles Recording Sessions, Seville recalls, They played the existing tape to me, which was complete, and I thought it had been recorded in a rather bad musical style, in that it was in the cracks, neither B flat nor B major. This posed a certain difficulty in tuning my instrument. Paul said, We want something there, can you play something that fits in? It was rather difficult to actually understand exactly what they wanted, so I made something up, which was middle register, a baroque style solo. A bass part and a tambourine were also recorded today to round up the song. Two events worth noticing in 1967. To begin with, manager Brian Epstein hosts the press lunch party for Surgeon Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band in his house in 24 Chapel Street in London. About a dozen journalists were invited to attend, along with several photographers. Linda Eastman, a young American freelance photographer, was among them too. In other news, BBC decided to ban a day in the life today for a perceived drug reference in the line I love to turn you on. The effects of the ban would be immediately noticed. As we will see tomorrow, DJ Kenny Everett found that he wasn't able to play an excerpt of the song during the special on Surgeon Peppers he had prepared for the Where It's At program, the only song excluded from the entire album. And I would love to think that I'm turning you on with this podcast, but I'm left in the dark without your inputs. Please drop me a line to tell me what you think about my work, or, even better, visit www.simonmas.com support 
to find out how else you can help me to improve the quality and the output of my music-related productions. Thank you for being fab and making the difference. 19th of May 1968. This came to pass as the official date in which John Lennon and Yoko Ono consummated their love affair for the first time. After meeting on the 7th of November 1966, check out episode 311 of What A Fab Day for that, and bumping into each other on several occasions, the two had started to keep in touch more and more. After the Beatles returned from India, Lennon and Ono were frequently speaking on the phone, and finally, with his wife Cynthia and his son Julian on a two-week holiday in Greece, John invited Yoko at his house in Weybridge. During the night, they recorded a sound collage that would become the basis of their first album together, Unfinished Music No. 1, Two Virgins, and, at dawn, they made love. The album featured avant-garde soundscapes but became legendary for its front and back cover, depicting the couple in the nude. Banned, attacked, criticized, the album never made any impact in UK and peaked at number 124 in the Billboard charts in USA. John started to collaborate with Yoko, producing several avant-garde films and albums during 1968. More importantly for the Beatles, Ono did play a part in the breakup. It might not be the case of being the principal actor in the demise of the band, like some still maintain today. In a way, one could say that Ono's presence exacerbated the friction that was already emerging between the four Beatles. Just by being there all the time, intruding in the very private space of a recording studio, the first time for any guest of the band, or for any partner of one of the four, she turned what had once been a refuge from the outside world into an uncomfortable or even hostile place. A lot has been made about John eventually turning to heroin with Yoko after they started to be a couple too. If I was pushed to give my personal opinion on the matter, after years of studying and reading about the Beatles, I think Yoko just happened to be an accelerator for the disintegration of the band. Had Brian Epstein not died, had the Beatles found a way to rest a bit more and let some of the wounds open during the recording of the White Album heal, had Paul been less pushy regardless of the fact that he just wanted the best for the band, had there not been under constant scrutiny by the media for whatever they were doing? Had they not attempted to turn themselves into businessmen? Had Apple not turned out to be a distraction and an expensive toy? Had they managed to unite on a third name when it came to choose between Klein and Eastman for their management? Well, perhaps had any of this happened, the story could have gone in a different way. As it was, for whatever reason, it all ended sourly. The episode ends on this bittersweet note. It might be funny to play the what-if game, but if you tune in tomorrow, as usual, you'll get more hard facts about the four you love. For the moment, I wish you a good day and a fab continuation. Simon Mas, music you love.